Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Naval History Conference, a joint event presented by the United States Naval Institute and the United States Naval Academy. Our theme this year is sharing the story of the U.S. military through the camera lens. My name is Midshipman 4th Class Olivia Hunt. You are watching the fifth of six webinars in our virtual event. If this is your fifth or even your first segment, we have another great one for you. Ask yourself, how much of what we see on the silver screen is fact? And how much is dramatized for effect? And what does the American public think of the military after they experience these films? We have an incredible panel this morning to discuss these questions. Our moderator is Miss Laura Law Millett, the Chief Operations Officer of the GI Film Group and the co-founder of the GI Film Festival. Her company is a non-for-profit organization and hosts the nation's only military film festival. The mission of the festival is to preserve the stories of our men and women in uniform through film and television. She is a U.S. Military Academy grad and has been an Army officer, now reservist, for 18 years, serving overseas in Korea, Turkey, Bosnia, and Germany. Our panel this morning is James Dever and Michelle Potts. Miss Laura Law Millett, the floor or set is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar portraying the military and the silver screen, process, implications, and influence. I want to thank Midshipman Hunt for that kind introduction. But before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, for your best viewing tips, please look at the tip section under the handout and the resource list. Second, we love questions. If you have questions, don't be shy. Please submit them through the Q&A engagement tool on your screen. There will be time at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the discussion for audience Q&A. <laughs> We're going to do our best to address as many questions as possible. And finally, an on-demand version of the webcast will be available in one day, and you, can and you can access it on the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. So enough housekeeping. Let's get started. Today, we have an amazing panel lined up for you today. Now, I know some of you were set to see Sergeant Major Deaver, but unfortunately, he was called to a movie set and won't be able to attend today's panel. But don't worry, he was replaced with a great replacement. So let, without further delay, let me introduce our panel. We have with us retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel Matt Morgan. Matt is a former Marine infantry officer turned public affairs officer who worked in the Marine Corps Picture Liaison Office in Los Angeles where he served as the DOD project officer for series such as JAG and NCIS. Following the military, Matt also worked as a Hollywood military technical advisor. He has provided technical support for many works, including such titles such as Sicario, American Sniper, Batman vs. Superman, Godzilla, Wind Talkers, Megan Levy, and Daredevil, just to name a few. In addition to consulting, Lieutenant Colonel Morgan is a filmmaker who produced the Smithsonian documentary the Unknown Flag Raisers of Iwo Jima. Now joining him on the panel today is Dr. Michelle Pouts. Dr. Pouts is a professor and assistant provost for the Common Academic Program at the University of Dayton. Dr. Pouts has authored several books and countless papers in peer-reviewed journals. She teaches and conducts research in environmental policy and regulation, government reform and accountability, and film and politics. So welcome to you both. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is about how film affects civ civilians' perception of people in the military. I, I grew up in a military family. My father was in the military. I later went to West Point and joined the military. And for most of my life, I met people who knew military people. But then after I left the military, I started running into people who had no military connection whatsoever. And I found it surprising that everything they knew about the military, they had learned from film and TV. So being that it seems that people are getting their perceptions of the military through film and TV, does Hollywood have an obligation to get it right? And I'll start with you, Matt. Well, thank you for the opportunity and the question today. You know, 
having worked on both sides of the coin, so to speak, having been both a Department of Defense project officer on film and television and having been, you know, a creative technical advisor on feature film and television, I will tell you that Hollywood's only obligation uh, as a business is to their bottom line. Um, they, they approach their representation of the military um, from two perspectives. One is financial and the other is production value. And production value is their ability to put uh, the most hardware, the highest quality representation they can on the screen consistent with the story. So they are only going to look at DOD as a partner uh, in production if it reduces their overall costs and simultaneously increases production value. That used to be, I would say, through the 80s and 90s, a, a really important decision for them in terms of production value. But as uh, computer graphics, uh, have, have the, the quality and the technology has become uh, what it is today, that's become less of a priority for them. So I would, I would tell you I have never met a filmmaker who put DOD representation or military representation as a priority and certainly would never put that ahead of story. Right. Dr. Potts, what are your, your thoughts on the subject? Uh, thank you. And thanks to all of you joining us today. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Matt has said. I would also add to his comments, Film is first and foremost an art form, and arguably the most accessible art form to Americans, with over 1.24 billion movie theater tickets sold last year. Now, who knows with COVID this year and closures, unfortunately, of so many cinemas, what that will be. But that also doesn't negate streaming services and other venues in which we all watch film. Um, filmmakers are artists. They're telling a story. That story needs to sell movie tickets. Um, that story needs to attract audiences. Um, and to your point, Laura, my research has shown that we absolutely do get our ideas about the military and government writ large um, through film and television. And I think it's really important to step back and think about what are those images, what are the perceptions we are bombarded with on the screen um, while we're also being entertained. That's, thank you for that. So it's, it's kind of interesting how a lot of times people get military and the military character confused and that it's they use those terms synonymously. And when my husband and I started the GI Film Festival, we specifically chose the name GI for the film festival because we wanted to tell the stories of the ground truth of what the experience is for the military member. Yet I think in, in Hollywood sometimes they don't really distinguish the difference between the GI and the military. And then those words are often interchanged. So is there a difference? Because a lot of times when you're telling the story of the GI experience, it's in around the arena of war. Is there a difference mm -hmm. between an anti-GI film and an anti-war film? Or are they are those really the same? And this time, I'll start with you, Dr. Pouts. I think that's a great question. I don't know. I think both of them, I would think about them as a spectrum. I think films that portray war run the gamut of being everything from pro-war to very anti-war. And then I also think there are films that are more favorable um, with the G with GIs and less favorable. So I don't necessarily see them either, or you could definitely see them um, tackling those questions um, and those portrayals in, in complex ways. Um, we, you know, and there's a lot of, as we look at some more contemporary military and war films, right? Some of them glorify war and some of them are also endeavoring, the filmmakers are endeavoring to show and depict war, um, the realities of war. And it's not maybe some of the glamorous films that we might think of historically. Uh, I'm thinking of, you know, from the 70s, everything from Apocalypse Now, which was sort of radical in its time, um, in, in showing the harsh realities of war. Um, and then we also have films like, and I know Matt has experienced directly, um, American Sniper that show this is what the lived experience is, at least a Hollywood version of it. Okay. And Matt, do you want to have comments about that? Well, I'm glad Dr. Pouts raised American Sniper because I think that's a very good example um, of a film that examines a character in a particular setting. Uh, the filmmaker in that case, Clint Eastwood, who uh, writes the scores for most of his films or most of his films, later films as a director, um, chose not to score that film. There is no music over that. And 
the reason was is he didn't want to leave the audience um, as a score is intended really to do, to tell you how to feel about a scene or a situation or an exchange. Um, and so what I saw coming out of American Sniper was that audiences left that film with largely what they took into it. Um, if they were opposed to the war in Iraq, they left feeling opposed to the war in Iraq. If they went in feeling that Navy SEALs, you know, are an amazing, you know, have the best snipers in the military, they left feeling Navy SEALs have the best snipers in the military. Um, so I think that when filmmakers do that, uh, they develop the character, you don't get a pro-war, anti-war, pro-GI, anti-GI sense. Um, and then I'll, I'll close with saying that uh, I think that when you talk about how a um, military member is portrayed, the better developed the character is, um, the less it tends to be pro or anti. And that's really true of, of any filmmaking. The better you develop a character, the less you're relying on the stereotype. Thank you. And I think that's a really good point. Well-developed ca characters tell the story, and that's what we should, or that's what we hope Hollywood focusing, what should be focusing on. So Matt, I'm gonna follow up with you because of that, and you've actually been on sets working with um, directors how do you balance their desire to entertain with the desire to be accurate in storytelling and making sure they get the story right? Where is that fine line? My philosophy is that accuracy is less important than authenticity. Um, and if you, I think Aaron Sorkin has said when he writes, he doesn't care if the dialogue is precisely accurate as long as it sounds authentic. And I think that's what filmmakers are happy to do. That's where you can find compromise. But, you know, I'll tell you one of the best scripts I ever read and one of the best quality films I ever worked on was Arrival. That was a fully formed script when we got it. And it was a film about the military management of first contact with superior intellectual extraterrestrials. There, there is no joint publication on that. So accuracy isn't something you're going to achieve. So you're going to strive for um, the authenticity. You want the audience to feel like it's authentic. So there may not be a right way to do it, but there's certainly wrong ways to do it. So you just want to skew to the more right side. The biggest challenge, however, I think is doing true stories or biopics. I've worked on three films that are either based on true stories or inspired by real events, um, American Sniper and Megan Levy. And I will tell you that sometimes when you're dealing with source material from a single source, you know, an original author or someone's life story, accuracy can be very difficult because if you are dealing with a Marine Corps Lance Corporal who spent five years in the Marine Corps, uh, she doesn't know everything about the Marine Corps. And so we, you may have challenges in how you portray accuracy while staying uh, consistent and true to that individual's experience. Sure, thank you. Now, Dr. Pout, so you know, talking about staying true to stories, you wrote a, a study or a paper from a study where you showed people a series of films about government workers. And after they watched those films, they changed their opinion about government workers. In fact, mm -hmm. actually their opinions um, increased and improved and they had a better likability for the characters. Do you think that it's important for Hollywood to portray military as likable characters for the long-term success of the military and to help with military recruitment? Is that something that they should be doing? I think that's a great question. I actually don't think that that's the obligation of Hollywood artists and filmmakers, right? Um, okay. Their job is to make a, um, it is to make an art form, I think that becomes, that behooves us as audience members to think about what are, and, and it goes back to the conversation with Matt around accuracy versus authenticity. What are we seeing in those films? And being somewhat critical, there's plenty of research that demonstrates when we're being entertained, we let our guard down. So watching a movie versus watching news broadcast. Sure. We're much more skeptical. We're, we're saying, hmm, is that true? how do I know that? Whereas when we're watching a movie, it's like, ah, oh, we're kicking back with the popcorn and enjoying ourselves as we should be. And so thinking about the ability of film to influence is where is the next is the origins, excuse me, of a lot of my research, because I have shown in various studies I've done, um, moviegoers, at least in my studies, uh, between a quarter and a third of move of the participants in my research have demonstrated that after they watch a movie, their opinions about the particular topic may change. And I think 
while at first you may say a quarter to a third big deal, that's most people didn't. Yeah, but in two hours, um, I did a study that looked at the intelligence community, community in Argo and in Zero Dark Thirty. If you got 25% to 30% of moviegoers changing their opinions about the IC and what happened to historical events, that's pretty significant. And again, I think the ultimate responsibility comes to us as audience members. Thank you. So Matt, what do you, what do you think? Do you think that Hollywood should play a role in military recruitment? Are they responsible for the long-term success of the military? They are certainly not responsible for it. I mean, it's not, it's not what they do. Um, I think that after the fact, if they see some sort of appreciable impact on public uh, impressions, um, I think Catherine Bowl would tell you, and Dr. Pouts would probably know this better than I, but Catherine Bowl would probably tell you that she takes some degree of pride in public understanding or impressions of the CIA as a consequence of the film. That wasn't her, certainly her intention in going out. Um, I think that, uh, I, I, well, I know for a fact that um, Clint Eastwood feels that uh, what they did in Space Cowboys for NASA what was a good thing. Um, so, it, because it presented NASA to a new generation that really hadn't experienced the space race. Uh, so I think that if there's an impression, Jerry Bruckheimer to this day probably feels very proud of what he did for Naval and Air Force Aviation in terms of Top Gun. So it's, it's kind of a, an ancillary effect if they feel like they did something that had a positive impact. Um, but I, at the same time, I think, if, you know, when Kimberly Pierce did stop loss, I think she would be, be happy to see that there was some increased awareness of what stop loss policy meant to individual troops and their families during a time of war. So, you know, you make films for a reason. Yes, they're entertainment, but most filmmakers have something that calls them to do it. Okay. Now, speaking of films like Stop Loss, which didn't very, do very well at the box office. And, you know, Hollywood, as you mentioned earlier, um, Lieutenant Colonel Morgan, is that Hollywood is based on box office receipts. Then when they do films, on the other hand, like, let's say, Top Gun or American Sniper, the box office receipts go up. And yet, whenever it's a positive movie glorifying um, being serving in the military, box office receipts go up. And then if it's a movie showing some of the devastation and the GI is a victim, box office receipts go down. Why do you think Hollywood continues to make films that show the military in a negative light, even though they know that that causes their box office to go down. And I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Pouts. Uh, I think Hollywood makes the movies they wanna make that their marketing analysis and their audience studies think will be successful. Let's keep in mind too, there are plenty of films that may not have been box office successes, but were received a lot of critical acclaim and or controversy around. I'm thinking of everything from Hurt Locker and Black Hawk Down, for example, um, that provoke conversation in society, or at least among audience goers, about, about the military, about its engagements, whether, and it, of course, how historically accurate is, is up for debate. I mean, I'm also thinking about Tom Hanks and Saving Private Ryan, for example and reintroducing World War II to generations, as, as Matt said, top um, space cowboys and NASA, right? Um, uh, reintroducing younger generations to past engagements of our nation. Okay. Uh, Matt, would you care to comment on that as well? Well, I think Dr. Powell's really summed that up well. I, but I would add that I don't, I think that some of the best movies um, are complex. You know, so American Sniper, for example, uh, I went into that film. I, I mentioned Arrival being the best script I'd ever read. American Sniper was the worst script I'd ever read. Um, and it was entirely drawn out of um, Chris Kyle's autobiography. And I didn't understand uh, what we were going to do uh, working on the film. And um, Jim Deaver, who had this was the fourth film that he had done with Clint Eastwood, said, I don't know, but... I trust Clint to do what he can do. And once I had the opportunity to, to, to experience what Bradley Cooper was doing with the character, um, I think he made him incredibly sympathetic, perhaps more sympathetic than Chris Kyle made himself in his own autobiography. So if you have good filmmakers and talented actors who are, who are focusing on that character development, you're going to get a film that is not one or the other, but provokes that kind of conversation that Dr. Potts talked about. 
Okay. And, and if I may just add real fast, I, I think that's so important for um, particularly young people who are the most frequent moviegoers is to see those complex portrayals and not sort of these stereotypical images of, of military and quite frankly, government service that seem to predominate. Um, we know film and you, you began here, Laura, right? Film and television influences attitudes. So understanding right. that things are more complex um, are, are really important. Great, thank you for sharing that. So we were talking about um, the actors and you were talking about how the actor can make a role. So yesterday on the panel, Captain Dale Zai, you know, a longtime Hollywood military advisor who had several great panels yesterday. Once when he was visiting uh, the GI Film Festival, he shared a sto the story about Gary Sinise and that he, when he was leading the actor through the military boot camp for Forrest Gump, he said he was impressed about how tough Gary was. And he thought, you know, you could have done it. You could have been a warrior or something that he, he told him. Can you guys talk about some of the sacrifices that directors and specifically the actors go through when they're trying to get a military role right? Some of the preparation that they do, some of the boot camps that they go through, what is it that they do? when they're successful at portraying a military character. And I'll start with you, Lieutenant Colonel Morgan. Well, you know, most professional actors want to do it right. They want to, uh, they want to bring the most that they can to their character. The, the, the most intense experience I had was when I was with actor training was as a DOD project officer on the film Wind Talkers. And we brought all of the stuntmen um, 60 plus or minus uh, core extras, background actors, and the, the principal cast. And we put them all in a squad bay at Marine Corps Base Kaneohe Bay. And we put them in World War II era dungarees. And we trained with World War II era equipment um, to, to the point that it culminated in a field exercise at, at Bellows Beach in the rain. Uh, in, it was Hawaii, but it was still in the rain. Um, and Every single one of these characters, uh, every single one of the actors brought everything they had to that role. And I think that I have to give Dale credit because he and Oliver Stone really started that kind of uh, actor experience going all the way back to Platoon um, and was, was very, rec they were recognized for what they did during Saving Private Ryan, um, which I think Dale probably told the story about uh, how Tom, all the actors wanted to quit. And Tom mm -hmm. Hanks assumed the leadership role and stepped forward and said, no, we're, we're not quitting and nobody's leaving here. So I think that those types of experiences, albeit um, scratching the surface of actual military training, uh, really are helpful for the characters, um, you know, and, and you see it on the screen. Wonderful, thank you. So we know that in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of films that came out about Vietnam and it they came out after the conflict had ended, and so there was time for perspective. Now today, while we're still having ongoing conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, films are coming out during the time of the conflict. Do you think there needs to be perspective gained and time to pass for them to tell an accurate story rather than creating a movie while the conflict was ongoing? And I'll direct this question to Dr. Pouts. I think that's a great question. It's a question I engage in regularly with my own students in film and politics. I don't know that there's an easy answer to it. I think there's good arguments for allowing time to pass. But I also think that as a nation, as we grapple with our role in the world, our engagement, the use of our military, the, um, sometimes film provides us a way, a door opening for some of the conversations to have a society. Um, I think from what I understand without any direct experience, but Catherine Bigelow and, and um, Zero Dark Thirty and talking about it contemporaneously through her film, um, reinvigorated conversation, whether we as a side, I'm always a fan as a political scientist of society having conversations about I mean, in a democracy, it's government of the people, by the people, for the people, to quib Abe Lincoln. We should be having conversations, and sometimes film provides a vehicle and, quite frankly, a vocabulary and an entry point into some of those conversations, which otherwise may be daunting. Great. And, and Sarah Crow Morgan, do you think there needs to be more perspective, more time passed before we start making films? Well, I think that there's, you know, during World War II, there were several films made about World War II. Um, during Vietnam, 
uh, you know, the Green Berets was a film that was made during that war and, and um, with the politics that John Wayne personally had, he, he very much wanted to make a uh, pro-military film at the time. Uh, but I think there's also tremendous value in, in gaining perspective uh, over time, and it's necessary. The, the, the opposite side of that coin is that audiences will experience war fatigue. And I think that's what you're seeing with many of the films about Iraq and Afghanistan today. Um, so I think with a little bit of time, audiences may have more interest in going back and reexamining that. Um, but, you know, for example, with American Sniper, if um, Chris Kyle hadn't been tragically murdered, that film would never have been made, you know, in that time frame. And so I think that there are various things that motivate studios and or independent production companies to make those films. Um, and I personally will, would say that there is a definite value in, in having some time and pers to, to develop perspective on, on a story. Great, thank you. So when we're looking back at time and perspective, um, I remember being a kid growing up in the 70s and 80s, and an insult that some kids would yell at each other was, your mother wears combat boots. In fact, they even made a movie called Your Mother Wears Combat Boots. So when we're looking at films from Private Benjamin, G.I. Jane, Courage Under Fire, all the way up to Megan Levy, can you guys talk about the evolution of the perception of women in the military? and? Did these films help open up occupational specialties to women, or was society already moving along those lines, and then the films were just a reflection of society? And I'll start the question with, with you, Dr. Pounds. I think that's a, another very good question. Um, in terms of my own research, I have tended to focus on samples of films that are huge box office draws. Um, which, based on my research, don't often include a lot of female characters um, in lead roles um, in military much or in the government writ large, because, again, my broader orientation is looking at the depiction of government in film. Um, I, I think there's some notable examples. I think I can't help but thinking of Demi Moore's character in A Few Good Men and the real emphasis in that Sorkin script on sort of Moore's character really embodying some stereotypes about women. Um, I, I don't know that that's helped or hurt. I think women, at least in my own research, are still largely absent from prominent roles. Thank you. And Colonel Morgan, would you care to draw uh, weigh in about women in the, in the films? Well, I, you know, certainly art tends to lead us a certain direction when it comes to um, those types of social issues of advancing the role of women in the military. I mean, obviously, the, the example of G.I. Jane was, you know, a woman in Buds um, who, you know, many, many, many years before women, that was open to women. Um, but I also think the opposite side of that is that screenwriters, we were talking in the green room before the the we started here today about how screenwriters tend to lean on stereotypes. And even in films like Megan Levy that are trying to advance the role of women or pre you know, present the role of women in combat roles, they still tend to lead tremendously on stereotypes. And, you know, one example was that the screenwriter in that film um, had a scene wherein the main character had to urinate in the field and had written a scene where like the male Marines like formed a circle around her. and, you know, the Sergeant Major and I were, were both like, you know, you go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom. You don't need to make it a big scene, but they, so they tend to still rely on some of these stereotypes about, you know, the presumed or so-called fragility of women in these environments. Um, and so we try to push those out the door as much as we can, but I still think that you're going to see those types of stereotypes used, even in films that purport to advance uh, women in leadership roles or in combat roles. Okay. Thank you. So I know filmmakers are out there and they're trying to do their best to make a good military film. Do they need DOD support to make a film or can they make a film without getting support from DOD and it having it be as realistic and as relevant? And, and this time I'll, I'll start with you, Matt. I don't think there's any filmmaker today that needs to rely on DOD support. 
Um, but there, there's going to be a trade-off, the decision that you're going to make, which is if you need a location, if you want to shoot on board a DOD installation, or let's say you're a low-budget film and you want the production value of having 12 Super Hornets on the tarmac in the background of a walk and talk, um, you're going to want DOD support because that's going to help you promote the production value of your film. But that's going to come with the trade-off. And you know, having been in that role, I've been involved in negotiations. And the fact is, is the DOD is not going to give you something for nothing. Uh, they, they may ask you to change dialogue. They may ask you to change a character. They may ask you to cut a scene. I've been in position to ask filmmakers to do all, all of those things. And so the filmmaker has to make a decision about you know, what do they want to do ultimately? Is it, is it worthwhile for them? Um, so today, big budget films don't really need DOD. Smaller budget films may. Which is, for example, why I think you see uh, the, the Air Force has worked on a few romantic comedies, um, which romantic mm -hmm. comedies tend to have about 10% of the budget that, uh, that big action films do. But that's an opportunity for them to promote their portrayal. And then the romantic comedy, which has a much smaller budget, like in maybe the 25 to $28 million range, um, is getting the, the production value of shooting on board Hickam Air Force Base. So. Okay. So we don't necessarily need DOD unless we're doing big budget. Got it. Thank you. So when um, Adam Driver came to the GI Film Festival, and many people know him from the actor who played Kylo Ren in Star Wars, he shared that being a Marine helped him become a better actor and that what he learned in the Marines helped him bring it to um, story, bringing, bringing those um, skill sets to storytelling. So I'll ask this start with uh, Dr. Pouts. Do you think that we need more military members behind the scenes? or in front of the camera to help get the storytelling right for the story of the military? I think that's a tough question in that I, I would simply posit we need greater diversity in those folks who are in front of the camera and behind the camera in all senses of that word. So with military experience and without military experience, and we were also talking before our panel got started this morning about connect our own connections you know, some of us are further and further removed from um, individuals who are serving our country. Um, so I think representing, I think the best possible stories can come from the broadest representation of folks involved in the film project. Wonderful, I agree with you. Diversity behind the camera makes a huge difference in storytelling. And Colonel Morgan, would you like to weigh in about that, about do we need more military members behind the camera, in front of the camera to help tell accurate stories? You know, I, I would say that I've worked with both military and non-military, and I've worked with military, you know, military veterans behind the camera who don't do a great job of telling the story, and I've worked with people who've never been in the military who do an exceptional job. I don't think that being uh, having being a veteran automatically makes you the best to tell the stories. Um, any more than not being a cop or not being a nurse or not being what you know whatever a lawyer uh, required is required to tell the stories in, in those genres as well. But I will say, and I saw you know I'll kind of preempt because I saw a question on this about veterans getting into um, film and television. And what I always tell them, is especially in terms of technical advising, well, how do they become a technical consultant? What I always tell them is go to film school. Go to film school, get in the Director's Guild program, become a production assistant, work your butt off. It's a meritocracy, you know, move your way up, understand all aspects of filmmaking, because, you know, really the best technical advisors don't just sit there and say, that's wrong, that's wrong. You know, you're heavily involved throughout every single department. You know, you'd be, a lot of military veterans would be very much at home on a film set because of the way film crews work. Is there's a military element to it in terms of uh, you know timing and departments, et cetera. So I just say get into the business, go to film school, get your foot in the door with the Directors Guild, and and work your way up into the system because the experience you bring is valuable, but it shouldn't be the only thing you bring. Wonderful, and that's some great advice. So thank you both so much. Um, I could keep asking you questions all day. But now we're going to open it up for questions and answers from the audience. And so I'm going to go through some of my questions and hear in the panel. Um, and the first question is directed for Dr. Pouts. It says, has your research identified the impact of digital platforms? Are Netflix, Apple TV, YouTube TV challenging the Hollywood stronghold on films? Thank you for the question. Um, because I'm so interested in the image and the 
the image on screen and then what an audience member takes away after seeing that image. I haven't spent a ton of time investigating digital platforms. Um, we all know they're there, right? That's how I watch movies these days too. I think what's interesting, and, and as I collect data from study participants, more and more um, individuals, that's their primary source of watching films. And it does enable more films and broader array of films in every sense of the word to reach viewers. It's not just, I mean, back in the day, um, I used to work in a movie theater, right? We only had the number of films that are the cinema chain I work for booked. Now with ready access across digital platforms, th the ability to see more films is, is significant and harder to study. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think also, for as far as film distribution, it's going to be easier for people to get their films out into the world because of the digital platforms, whether having to pay a booker and go through the movie theater system. Right. Okay, the next question I'm going to direct to Matt, and this is from Willard Strandberg. He talks about Black Hawk Down was a tragic and he heroic movie portraying valor in a failed effort. How did this movie impact the public's understanding of the military role of carrying out a mission that results in a loss? You know, that's probably something that's more in Dr. Pouts's field in terms of what the impact of a film is. I, I don't know. Um, I, well, the only thing I can speak to in terms of Black Hawk Down, because that was produced when I was the director of the Marine Corps office in Los Angeles, was that the filmmakers worked uh, very hard to get it right. They had the advantage of having several of the individuals portrayed in the film on set or involved in production. And they made an ask of the Department um, of, of Defense in, in, that had never been asked before, which was the idea of, uh, of getting um, aircraft from the Special Operations Aviation Regiment um, and members of the 75th Ranger Regiment on set to be part of their filming. Um, so they worked very hard to get it right. So I think that Tony Scott would, would tell you that one of the principal things he wanted to do was to tell that story right. And so any impact that he intended to or did have was to present uh, a, a broader understanding, a more intricate understanding of what happened in a conflict and particularly in a, a battle in Mogadishu that probably didn't really penetrate the public's understanding very well. Sure. And, and Dr. Potts, do you want to add into that? Was there any impact that you could see in your studies of how whenever we show a movie that depicts loss, does that affect people's uh, perception? I think it's more complex. Um, I don't I have not used that film in any of the studies I've conducted, so I can't speak to the data I've collected on it. What I can say about that film, and it goes to some of our earlier conversation in here, it's more complicated. I think U.S. involvement in Somalia um, and the and what happened, I, I think that film, and again, I'm an outsider here, demonstrated it's far more complex. And I think movies that are well done, characters that are well developed, can help us understand the complexities because I think it is too... I think there's a propensity to quickly um, reinforce our own bias and say, oh, you, uh, of course that bad stuff happened, it's over there. Or of course, I, I think it's too easy to bring our own preconceived notions to it and a film like that can help provoke conversation. Great, thank you. All right, the next question is from Jeff Dunn. He said, there's a lot of talk about how China is actively shaping film for the purpose of portraying the country in a positive light in entertainment med media. Can you comment on this from the perspective of the U.S. military? Is this something that we should be doing? And I'll start with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Morgan. What do you think? Should we be, I don't know, for a better word, adding propaganda uh, and sending out positive films about the U.S. out into the world? Or the are Department we already doing it? Defense, the Department of Defense has been doing that to the degree that it can for decades. Um, you know, we're obviously, we live in a democracy. Um, we can't we leverage filmmakers to use the DOD, but we we do because we are capitalists. We we enter into this quid pro quo kind of relationship where say, um, you know, the first feature film I ever worked on was Rules of Engagement, and so I don't know if many of the audience recognize the film, but it was Samuel Jackson and Tommy Lee Jones, um, and the inciting incident in the film, Samuel Jackson plays a Marine lieutenant who executes an NVA uh, prisoner in Vietnam. 
And so the Marine Corps, our higher leadership was, did not want to work on that film because of this. But, you know, you also have to recognize the needs of the filmmaker. And if you don't have that inciting incident, you don't have a film. The story falls apart. And ultimately what the director wanted was he wanted one day of shooting on board and, you know, an amphib uh, at sea with some helicopters. And that was it. Um, so we entered into an agreement wherein we would help shape the script um, in a way that benefited the United States Marine Corps and the portrayal in the film and got the director what he needed. So that's kind of an example of the type of relationship that the DOD has been entering into um, and, and would continue to enter into so long as filmmakers believe that it's worth worth the trade space for them to do. Okay. And kind of a follow-on question, uh, Jennifer Kim has asked, with increased ownership overseas, how does that affect the authentic portrayal of the U.S. and our own military? So is there anything that we can do to counter the inaccurate and purposeful negative portrayals? And uh, Dr. Potts, I'll add that, ask that question for you. I'm not sure that I can speak directly to that question. What I would add for the conversation around the influence of China and the Chinese audience, um, from what I read about the economics of Hollywood, China is increasingly the largest market for Hollywood films. And so much of my research has focused on top box office grossing films as a way to call a sample of films to study. Films that have high box office reaches, we're seeing a shift in the kinds of films that make it into that illustrious um, category of films as box office gold. So that's changing the nature of at least those big budget and, and projects that are, are likely to get greenlit. And again, with my interest broadly on government and film, we're seeing different kinds of governments, different, different roles for government in these films, in part because of the evolving nature of the market for American films. Great, thank you. All right, the next question. One, sure, one thing to that is, um, the biggest issue that impacts technical advisors and the accurate portrayal shooting anywhere is gun laws in that particular location, um, whether it's New Mexico versus New York versus North Carolina, or it's UK, Spain, and Germany. Um, because those the laws in those countries can make it very difficult for you to get the proper weapons to do your job. And that really goes for, for a number of things, for any type of ordinance item. So when you see films shoot overseas, it has a huge impact on the accurate portrayal of military for those things that, like, that really matter to military viewers. Wonderful. That, that's fascinating. Those are things that you don't think about. Gun laws. Even if you're using prop guns, it's still considered uh, things that you have to worry about. Yeah, and even prop guns. I mean, you can't, if you're going to fire a machine gun from a turret, we, when we did Megan Levy and we had to shoot an M240 out of a turret of a Humvee, getting the M240 into the country and then getting the ammunition that we needed to operate the weapon, even though it was a blank modified weapon, what took weeks and we almost didn't even think we were going to get it. So those, those do have an impact. Wow. I love the behind the scenes stories. Thank you. But the next question is for Matt. It says, while you were a Marine, this is from Tom Secker, while you were at the Marine Corps Entertainment Office, you worked on the Hulk. One of the script changes requested by the Marines was the removal of a reference to the Vietnam era operation Ranch Hand. What was the thinking behind that change? I can't speak to that. I don't, you know, I was the director during that time. I was not the project officer, however, and I don't remember. So I wish I could answer that question. Um, it would, but what we tended to do was, you know, look at the script in the totality and, and anything in there that we wanted to, to modify it was, was something that was up for negotiation. But I don't know why that was a point of negotiation for the Marines at the time. Okay. Now, this is, is a question um, for either of you, but I guess we'll start with Dr. Pouts. Do you believe that military films, television shows, et cetera, can be utilized in the classroom to help students understand military history through the lens of Hollywood, in, if used in conjunction with the primary source materials of the event? If so, what would your recommendation be for creating such a class? And this is from Dylan Burrell. Thanks for the question. Um, absolutely. I teach film and politics courses um, at the University of Dayton. Um, and 
yes, I, I, use, I mix it up every semester. I teach the course and mostly out of my own interest of which films and which topics we want to talk about. And um, I think it's really important too, not only to look at primary source material alongside a film, but also to think about the time and the context in which the film was made. Again, drawing on a non-military example, if you'll humor me for a moment, Talking about audiences' receipt of Frank Capra's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. None of us were alive when that film was released, but I think it's also, I'd add to primary source material, also thinking about the time of the filmmakers and the time in which the film was released is equally important as well. Great. All right, and the next question, I'll start with uh, Matt. There seems to be an evolution of how veterans are portrayed um, since the hero of World War II to the monster of Vietnam to the victim of Iraq. Is there any truth into telling the stories this way? And if not, what can we do to fix the portrayal of the veterans? Well, I think that filmmaking has evolved tremendously uh, in that period of time. The, the way that films were structured in, you know, that the period follow, during and following World War II was a, a much simpler structure. Uh, and as filmmaking has become more complicated and, and the voices of, of different uh, screenwriters and filmmakers has come forward, I think that you're going to continue to see uh, complicated characters, more complicated characters. Um, I, I also will tell you that Hollywood does have a predisposition to tell um, certain kinds of stories. And um, today, I think it is much, much harder to get a very straightforward um, A-B picture uh, made, where you're, you know, you've got your character A and character B, and over the course of the picture, they move closer together, and, and there's a happy ending. And um, so... I think that the best way to counteract that is to continue to, to bring forward the best stories that we can bring forward as veterans. And, you know, you mentioned source material in the previous question. The more veterans write about their experiences, the more source material there is. Um, you know, when the book um, Redeployment, Phil Cly's book Redeployment, um, won the National Book Award, uh, Judd Apatow um, sent him a a tweet, you know, a DM and said, I want to collaborate with you. So I think that getting the, the right source material into the public view um, uh, is going to be one of the ways that we can influence the types of stories we see on the screen. Wonderful. And I think that's a, just a great note for all the people out there that are listening to this um, panel discussion. Write, get out there, write your stories, tell your stories, share your stories so that we can have uh, better stories out there. All right, the next question is from Jeff Dunn. He says, we know that DOD does more than traditional war. Beyond war, what other kinds of settings, topics, would the DOD want to see itself being portrayed within? I, mean, I think it might be a little bit difficult to speak for DOD, but maybe what other stories can we have? And uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Fouts. I, I think in, when we're talking about the work and the role of government and society, um, we see much more government, perhaps in the background. Um, again, I can't speak to DOD, to Laura's comment here. Um, but I think the role of the government underlies so many more films than you might even stop and think about. I'm often reminded of the example of Batman films, right? Government isn't, doesn't play a prominent role in Batman. But you have to have government and challenges with government, because why else do you have a need for Batman in the first place, right, in Gotham City? So I think that the, because government's role in our society is so ubiquitous, those roles can translate into film. They may not be the most glamorous or sexy plots, um, but as a political science professor, too, I'd say, hey, let's have more conversation about it. Let's have more portrayals of it, because just like Top Gun did wonders for recruiting, um, maybe we, if we had different images of government on the big screen, we wouldn't be facing a, a, a shortage of people to work in the public sector and serve the nation in a variety of capacities. Thank you. So Dylan Burrell asks, why do you think that Hollywood feels that they have to include a love story in a war story? I'm thinking of 30 seconds over Tokyo. Uh, I'll start with you, Matt. 
why do you think they feel like they need to include a love story? There's a there's a book that is often cited in Hollywood as the screenwriter's Bible, and it's called Story by Robert McKee. And McKee has taught, you know, virtually almost every screenwriter that's working in Hollywood, or they'd have been a minimum read what he what he has. And, and he tells you that there are archetypes that go into a script. You have a hero, you have an anti-hero, you have a character reflection, and you have a love interest. And in order for your script to work, you've got to have all these things. Um, and so th there will often be conversations um, in a film that is otherwise exclusively, say, about a military operation, or uh, the doctor could probably talk to this uh, in terms of Fargo. Um, you know, how did how did they take this true story based on a true character, and w when did they bring in a love interest, and how did they bring in the love interest, and why? So um, oftentimes, it's just really about full character development. Um, and and what that brings to the experience um, of you know of war or the conflict that you see the character. Thank you. And I would Dr. just Pons would in. like to add something. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, I think it's helping audiences relate and connect. I think we all go to the, the movies, and no matter the futuristic societies that are portrayed or whatever, we are still looking for some connection to our realities. And I think the love interest is more tangible, perhaps, than serving overseas um, for many Americans. Um, and so I think just in terms of filmmakers attempting to reach and connect with their audience, you often see that. Thank you, and I agree. I actually like a good love story in, in a war movie or any movie. All right, I understand that how that can turn some people off. All right, the next question is from Michael Holler. Can you talk about the Army and the production of The Long Road Home? So Matt, can you please answer that question? How did the Army participate in that film? You know, I don't have any personal knowledge of that project itself, so I, I'm frankly at a loss. I, I don't know anything about it. Okay. Is there anything that you can comment? Maybe can you pick a film that you did work on and talk about the way that um, the military participated in the filmmaking process? Well, let's, so let's take one where the, the military is a portion of it. Um, mm -hmm. we, we knew that the sum, the sum of all fears based on a Tom Clancy novel was being made. And there's a scene where um, a nuclear weapon goes off and the president is the presidential motorcade is speeding away from the ground zero in the hopes of getting escaping what they knew would be a nuclear detonation. Um, and they're just on the periphery of it. And the motorcade is, is hit and the, um, the, the beast, the presidential limo is flipped. Um, and the filmmakers came to us and they said, how, how do we get the president out of this situation? And I said, well, just have the Marines come get it. So um, we, uh, we were, they, they were shooting in Canada. Uh, so it was a little bit of a trick, but we were able to get a reserve unit of CH-53s out of Ohio to fly to Canada, um, along with several of the Marines from the unit that portrayed the infantry Marines. And we added a line of dialogue where a Marine opens the door of the beast and says, U.S. Marines, Mr. President, come with us. Um, and so for us, it was great because we were, we were able to get the CH-53s in there, you know, the biggest helicopters in the Western world. The director absolutely loved them. And, uh, in, in, of course, in the scene, the camera rakes down the side of the 53 and it just says U.S. Marines. You know, and so from our perspective, it doesn't get any better than that. We got the visual, we got the, the, the wording on the side of the helicopter, and we got a line of dialogue. So that for us, that was a win-win. And it was, you know, we charged the production company a few thousand dollars for the hours on the aircraft, but that was it. So that's the type of thing that I think that DOD is always looking to get into if you have an opportunity and a filmmaker who's willing. Wonderful. We love it when we get DOD support into films to help with the storytelling. Uh, the next question I'll ask are, are there any longstanding but erroneous public perceptions of the military that have been perpetuated by movies? Dr. Pouts? I think it's hard to pinpoint um, any specific erroneous perceptions. I mean, we as Americans have a lot of erroneous perceptions about our government um, by virtue of how we consume information about our government. And the vast majority of us are not 
in uniform or civil servants at any layer of government. Um, and I think there's a tendency to conflate what our politicians do and what our civil servants who wear uniforms or who are in various sectors of society. So as a result, I go back to something I said earlier, we as audience members have to think about the attitudes and the perceptions we bring to the movies and what the movies may impart on us. And none of it's better or worse or good or bad. It's just, it, it is what it is in, in a social world. Okay, so you're saying that we bring in our, our biases to it. So Matt, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I just wanna add, I think that what we experienced was that the most damaging misconception that Americans have in the military is that orders are orders. And you're told to do something, you gotta do it. Um, so the concept of, of a lawful order um, or being able to, to modify an action based on what you're told is, um, is something that a lot of people still don't understand. Great. All right, the next question is from Amy Peacock who asks, are there World War I and World War II, World War II stories that are never told that are still worthwhile bringing to the light of the film? I would like to say the short answer is yes, <laughs> but Matt, what do you think? Well, yeah, there are, I mean, there are all kinds of stories out there that need to be told. And I think that one of the things for um, Hollywood is they always need a hook. Um, you know, so we, we got, you know, the, the uh, Steven Spielberg's invasion of Normandy in Saving Private Ryan, but there had to be a hook that was uh, essentially inauthentic or I'm sorry, inaccurate. It was, you know, wholly inaccurate, the idea that they would pull together these group of guys and send them to get this one dude. But it, there was enough authenticity to it that it, it, it created the opportunity to tell a story in this setting. Um, I think that uh, I, for one, along with many Marines, would love to see the story of the Battle of Bella Wood told on screen. Um, but finding a hook to be able to tell that, then there, there, there comes the you know, the question of, is there a supernatural element? Is there a love story? It's got to be, you know, two pieces to it. So that that's what they're always looking for is, you know, it either has to be an exceptionally compelling true story, like 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, um, or, you know, have some kind of, of hook to it. And, uh, for example, when I was in Los Angeles when Michael Bay and Jerry Bruckheimer came into all the services and they said, hey, we there's never been a movie made of the Doolittle Raid. And everybody in the room said, yeah, uh, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. And they're like, oh, really? Um, but so their story of Pearl Harbor and the Doolittle Raid all put together around a love triangle. Um, and you can determine yourself for yourself whether or not that worked for you, but they needed that love triangle to be this, the narrative center of the story that let them tell you know, something bigger about the Pearl Harbor and the Doolittle so yes, there's still more stories out there to be told. So please look up, look look it up. All right, the next question I, I'm going to have to Dr. Pouts: What movies have had the greatest influence on the military's public image, and that could be either positive or negative? I think to to address that question, one has to get a bit more specific in terms of recruitment or in a particular time. Um, we, I think we've already alluded to it in the green room before our conversation. We were all chatting about Top Gun and the ability of that film to influence all of us um, and what I understand it did for recruitment in the military. I mean, I would generally assume that's positive and that probably explains why a sequel just got made, um, although its release keeps getting delayed. Um, there's also been a lot of controversy. Films about Vietnam that were critical um, met with a lot of resistance and conversation. And again, I, it's a great question. I, I think it's just kind of hard to answer in a quick little nugget um, because it, it depends so much on context. Okay, I understand. And that's probably something that we're gonna need a lot more time to delve into. All right, I think we're, we're kind of wrapping up and we're coming down to our last few questions. So I'm going to ask uh, the next question uh, for Matt. Is it arguable that the case of all war movies, if they portray the military in a positive light, are inherently propaganda? In the same way that anti-war movies are, inher are inherently propaganda of the opposite kind. So put another way, is it possible to ever make a military movie that is not um, propaganda? I don't think that there is... Um... I, I don't make 
war movie is a binary choice between pro-war and anti-war because I think you know, oftentimes you are going to take out of it what you bring into it. Um, th there are cult classics in the Marine Corps, I know from my personal perspective, um, Full Metal Jacket, uh, Platoon, some of these Vietnam War movies are classics. Every single Marine has seen them. Um, and I, I think you could probably lean both of those toward having an anti-war perspective. Um, so, you know, for one reason or another, I, I will tell you that part of what I did not working in the movies, working at the Pentagon, um, was we, we would often, we did influence operations and we talked a lot about propaganda. And I think it's important to remember that the word propaganda comes from the Vatican um, and it's about, you know, the propagation of the faith. Um, so if you're telling a story that, that propagates the faith, the core values of an organization and it expresses what we're about, then at its heart, it is propaganda. And, and I would, I would remove the negative connotation of that word from it because it is, I mean, it, law and order SVU is cop propaganda. Um, you know, you, you probably think of a number of, of movies about hospitals that are, that are med, you know, medical profession propaganda. So anytime you take these characters and you show what their lives are like and you see them working to be a part of something greater than themselves, you know, that's what it is. Um, and so you just kind of let the filmmaker do what they do and um, try to pull, take away from it what they want you to take away. Thank you. And, and Dr. Paltz, what, what are your thoughts on this? I think that was a great synopsis of it. I think I think propaganda, exactly as Matt said, right, has a lot of negative connotation or it's used pejoratively. I, you know, every filmmaker has his or her own point of view. Every audience member comes in with their own perceptions. Um, and I think that's just in, in, being critical and being reflective of what we're consuming for entertainment value is important. Great. All right, thank you. And for our final question, this is going just to be a fun one. I'm going to ask you, um, what are you, what is your favorite military movie and why? And we'll start with you, um, Colonel Morgan. You know, I, whenever people ask me what I think the most accurate and authentic film is, um, I tell them it's Pentagon Wars, um, which was an HBO mm -hmm. film about the acquisition of the Bradley fighting vehicle. Um, it gets everything right. So if you've ever if you've ever worked in the Pentagon or an acquisition, um, that film is going to hit it right on the nose for you. Wonderful. And Dr. Potts, favorite film and why? Uh, oh, I I think I'd have to admit to Top Gun just because I saw it when I was probably too young to watch that movie, but ever since then has cultivated a love of military aircraft for me. And that's I have to trace it back to watching that movie. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your insightful comments and being on the panel today. I want to thank you panelists for being here. I also um, thank you the virtual audience for their amazing questions and being very particip participatory in this event. And I also would like to thank the Naval Institute for putting together these uh, series of panels for the, these last two days. So just a quick reminder as we wrap up, the on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after this ends. And you can use the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Um, also, I want to say I'm looking forward to the next panel that's coming up. So we're going to invite everyone to take, take a break, stretch your legs, but you want to you want to come back to the next panel. It begins at 1.30. You don't want to miss this panel. It's an amazing panel. The filmmakers from Three Penny Films are going to take you through the filmmaking process. They're going to share details on how you can enter your film into a virtual film festival where some of the winners will be eligible for cash prizes. So tune into that workshop for more information. So also looking something that we had to look forward to, I know Army-Navy football is coming up in uh, December 12th. And with COVID, things have changed a lot. So I know rules are going to be a little bit different from the past. In fact, I heard that the uh, Navy is not even going to have any ice on the sidelines. And while that's not really a COVID factor, I think that has to do with the guy who had the recipe he graduated last year. So thank you again, um, everyone, for joining in the panel. I look forward to seeing you in the future and at the movies. Have a great rest of your day.